Amen. Good morning, church. What an exciting day today. Well, today we close out our series on prayer. My prayer is that your prayers have changed a lot over the course of the last six weeks. Uh, let's begin with our text in Luke chapter 11. Let's begin with our text, Luke chapter 11. We'll read all that we studied through here in Luke 11, 1 through 4. You know, we have a saying in the world that we saved the best for last. And yet, when God designed our prayer life and how we are to approach him in prayer every day, I really do believe he saved the best part for last. This is often a totally forgotten part of prayer. Uh, let's begin by praying ourselves. Father, we thank you so very much that you have given us this phenomenal place to meet. Father, a place where we can be comfortable with air conditioning, uh, where we can have our snacks, our drinks, all of the things that, uh, that, that we enjoy when we are learning uh, how to follow you. And, uh, and you've given us a place where our children are right next to us and they're completely safe. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, right now, we want to turn our focus and our attention to you. Certainly, as we learned, our, you are our audience today. We are singing, we are worshiping for no one but you. And I pray it is the focus on you that we have. As we enter this new journey, this... Uh, this new part of our journey in the region uh, with our new meeting location here, I do pray this last part of the prayer that you will guard us from temptation, that you will guard us from disunity, from complaining, from anything that turns our eyes away from you. We thank you. We love you. It is in your son's name that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Luke 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place and Hopefully by now you have gotten your certain place where you are praying each morning. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Today we'll be covering the lead us not into temptation part of this prayer. Interestingly enough, uh, turn over to John chapter 6. There was a time in Jesus' ministry where there was a lot of transition. And there was a lot of problems. And yet this Part of the journey for Jesus and his disciples uh, brought a lot of change. And, and yet, when there's a lot of change without prayer, we see what we're going to read right here. John chapter 6 and in verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Well, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, well, does this offend you? You know, uh, typically we want leaders when when we say something's hard, to back off. And, uh, and yet, that's not what Jesus did here. He actually got in their face. Yeah. He's like, does this offend you? Yeah. I love what he says right here, because we can read through it without really grasping what he was really saying about being with them. He says, does this offend you? Well, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven where he was before? He says, well, how about if I just go home? What if I just leave you now? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. See, they were focused on man and flesh and not God. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet some of you do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. We wish we would know that, huh? But we don't. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Check this out. 
From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You think Jesus might get discouraged there, right? And yet he turns to the 12 and he says, uh, do you want to leave too? Do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Wow. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And the church said, Amen. You know, I've been a disciple 23 years. And there's something I figured out. So we have this goal of evangelizing the nations in our generation, right? And yet there are places that don't have churches. You know, it's just the darndest thing. How are they going to get there except to have some transition? How will people get where they go if we don't send them and lose people from different churches and different places and raise money to get them there? You know, uh, the first time around when we, we had our first movement, it was a lot cheaper to send out mission teams. And then 9-11 happened. And everything changed. It's like 10 times more to send a mission team now than it was back then. And, and yet, it still just takes us back. Like, this was a hard teaching. I mean, when you said give up everything, I didn't think you really meant it. And yet it grieves me every time we go through transition. It never gets easier. Yes, we have more understanding and more perspective, which helps us get through it, but it never gets easier watching friends leave, watching different people come and go, having to adjust to new weird leaders and different things that are going on, you know? It never, that never gets easier because it's change, which, rely, which requires we rely on the Lord and Him alone, amen? But there's a pattern that I've observed over 23 years that I'd like to share with you. It's true 100% of the time. 100% of people that walk away from God and his church do not pray this prayer the way God taught them to pray. 100% of every disciple that says they get weak because of transition and different changing and different things like that, 100% of them are not praying this prayer the way Jesus taught them to pray. And 100% of every person stuck in repetitive sin is not praying this prayer the way Jesus taught them. Today, I pray that you will begin, if you haven't, to start praying this way. Amen? Amen. Funny little story about temptation. A minister parked his car in a no parking zone in a large city because he was short on time and uh, couldn't find a space to park. So he put a note on the windshield that read, I have circled the block 10 times. And if I don't park here now, I'll miss my appointment. Forgive us our trespasses. <laughs> Amen. When he returned, he found a citation with a note. And the note said, I've circled this block for 10 years. And if I don't give you a ticket, I'll lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. You know, see, our nature is to be like the minister. We want to be able to sin without feeling the consequences. We want to give in to temptation without feeling the effects of giving in to those things. I have a newsflash for you. Your enemy is Satan. You don't have the ability to defend yourself. Making this part of the prayer one of the most important aspects of your life. See, God in his infinite wisdom allows you to be tempted. Then he gives you the ability to call on him for every power that's needed so you don't give in to the temptations. Interestingly enough, God allowed the Israelites... We talk about their 40-year journey a lot. I want to reference their 400-year stint where they were stuck in Egypt in slavery. God allowed that. It was interesting to me that he only acted to save them when they turned to him and cried out to be saved. So many look for men to save them. And yet you and only you can make the choice to turn to God 
to ask him for the strength and power to get through this life that you're living. Amen. You have every opportunity to be persistent, as persistent as you want in asking God to give you the power you need until he gives it to you. Because if you ask, he will give. The problem is, many of us are too proud to beg. <laughs> There's not the right kind of fear in our heart. And we are literally too proud to beg God for strength. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Right. Let me tell you, I'm not too proud to beg. <laughs> I'm not too proud to beg God for strength. And I'm not too proud to beg you to live in a right way so you can make it to heaven. You think about the sins that we talk about over and over and over again that you may choose to get into. If I had to get on my knees to beg you, I would. But why should anyone have to beg you? Wow. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 See, people beg kings for mercy. That's how it's been forever. Kings rule the lands, and people beg them for mercy so they're not thrown into jail. And yet, God is a king. Jesus is our king. And yet, we're Americans, so we don't beg for anybody. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, again, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For if we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, amen, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Isn't it interesting that we need grace in our time of need? Pop on over to chapter 5 right there, verse 2. I love the way the Bible says Jesus deals with us. The Bible says he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray. Since he himself is subject to weakness. The Bible almost always refers to those going astray as ignorant. Now, that's an offensive word to a lot of people. Really, all it means is you don't know any better. Because if you really knew the consequences that were coming, if you really knew heaven and hell and the end of that road, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. It's just we don't take the time in our prayer and in our Bible study to find out that truth. In verse 7, we see how Jesus deals with all of it. Chapter 5, verse 7 here. This is how Jesus got through this life, okay? During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions, check this out, with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him. And he was heard. Do you know sin is the very thing that blocks people's prayers from yeah. being heard? And yet the Bible says right here, Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. Wow. Although he is a son, he learned obedience, check this out, from what he suffered. Oh, and once made perfect, became the source of eternal salvation. For everyone, right? No. For all who obey him. And was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. See, the way Jesus got through his temptations. The Bible says that Jesus himself was subject to weakness. At our best, spiritually, we're weak. All of us. We're frail men and women before God and his angels. If we could peel back the spiritual curtains and yeah. see the reality, yeah. most of us, literally, the Bible says, we'd, we'd fall dead yeah. at what we saw. Yeah. And yet we don't pray like we're out of touch. We pray like we are out of touch. 
today I just, I mean, look around the room here. It's so beautiful. You guys look great. Everybody's dressed up. It's, everything's nice. Yet we're in a war against demons and against Satan himself. I mean, there's one right there. Right there next to you. There's one right over here next to you. I met Abdul over there. There's one right next to him. How do I know that? There's legions of demons for every one of you. That's how I know that. Don't think they don't come in this room. Every one of you is weak spiritually. Let them in. They're not scared of you, so they're right next to you. You pray like this, they may not be next to you anymore. But you think about Jesus. We think about the miracles. We think about the walking on water. But what we don't think about enough is Jesus was a man. The Bible says he lowered himself. See, he went from being a God to being a man who was subject to the same exact weakness and temptations that you and I are subject to. And he made the decision to not give in when he was tempted as a man, not as a God. To set an example for you and me that that you and I can do that as well. And yet, we have every reason why we give in to our temptations, don't we? Oh, we got a list. We could all be authors on the reasons why we give in to our temptations. Yes, Satan wants nothing more today than to tempt you and deceive you into believing every lie that he can come up with. He's been coming up with them since the beginning of time almost. Right after creation, the, the angels came too. That's when he came. He's been around since then. We talk about, oh, I, I've been around this church four years. And then the old days, man, I'm one of the old guys in this region. Well, he ain't got nothing on Satan. He ain't got nothing on his demons. He knows his Bible better than you. He knows you better than you. He knows what you're going to do before you know it. He's 10 steps ahead of you. You got no chance except for to go to God for strength. We not only have all our reasons why we give in, but we have all our people who we blame for our temptations. And here's the ironic thing. God does not tempt you or me. Boy, I think he does sometimes, though. I don't know about you, but I just do. I, I know it. I know it up here. But the temptation to focus on the flesh and people just takes me over sometimes. But he does. God doesn't do it, but he allows Satan to. That's what we're going to read here in a moment. If you do not pray to not give in to temptation, you will give in to temptation. Go to James chapter 1. My first point today is that you make you sin. James chapter 1. <laughs> Guess that was a good point, huh, Tim? <laughs> Amen. James chapter 1. Today I want you to learn to pray in your toughest times, believing God can and will save you from having to give in to every temptation. James 1 verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Check this out. But each one, he's talking about you and me, right, is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Wow. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin is born from your desires. Then when full grown, sin turns in, the Bible says here, to death. Spiritual death. You know what that looks like? It looks like you're not here. That's what that looks like. First, it looks like you're just here with an attitude. Well, no, first it just kind of looks like you're here not committed. Then you're here with an attitude. Then you're here all about talking about somebody that is, because, is the source of your temptation. And then you're not here. That's how it works. That's the oldest trick in the book. Satan's been doing it since the beginning of time. And yet he still gets us. Because we don't believe I make me sin. 
I think Tracy makes me sin, or Tim makes me sin, or you make me sin. But no, I make me sin. Come on, bro. I mean, so some of you are in a right relationship with God. Some of you may not be. And yet, those who are in a right relationship with God, the Bible says that God's spirit lives inside of you. You are one with God. That was the prayer Jesus prayed before he went to the cross, John 17. That you would be one with God as he was one with God. And the more righteous and the more you eliminate sin from your life, the more you feel that. Yet the truth is, Jesus' blood washes over every sin you commit, and he views you as perfect like that already. That didn't blow your mind. That should have. That's part of the problem why we give in to temptation. Because it doesn't blow our mind that in our cook and our garbage and all of our sin, that God looks and says, wow, he's perfect. She's perfect. And Jesus did that for you. But if you're one with God, and yet somebody says you're the source of their temptation, then they're saying God is tempting them because you're one with God. And yet God does not tempt anyone. So how can anyone in here make you sin? Think about it. See, Satan dupes us. Think about the last sin you committed. It may have been yesterday. It may have been right before service. I mean, it may have been whenever, you know. It could have been, you could be mad right now, somebody said. <laughs> and just not letting it go. Just let it go. It ain't worth it. I, I know I sinned this morning. I, we got here, brand new place, people everywhere. Ah, and I was like, and there were a few things just, that got, the ball got dropped. And I was like, ooh. And I know Adam saw my face, and I was like, uh, I'm going to take a walk. Because <laughs> I'm, te- I'm about to talk about temptation and not giving in, and I'm giving in the day I'm preaching the lesson. <laughs> Dang it, man. Like, oh. And yet, the fact that certain things were not set up right, is that what, really why I sinned? Or did I have a desire inside me for everything to be perfect? And when it wasn't, then I was ready to sin already. <laughs> Satan doesn't take you out. Like, we, we love, like, watching MMA and just like, Ugh! We love that stuff. And we want to think that's how Satan takes us out. And it's just not. It is not how Satan comes after you. Satan comes after you, like, with a touch. Just, you ever had somebody just bug you and just, just get you, just a little annoyed? Just get your defenses down a little bit? Oh, that didn't really hurt. I'm good. And then just another touch. You know, oh, let me just start pulling on this thread, you know. And then 10 years later, there's no shirt left, and you're naked before everybody, and embarrassed, and then he just, then, boom, brings the whammo. It's called the domino effect. Just a little piece, a little thing, a little thing, a little. And then one by one, your life starts crumbling if you don't pray this prayer every day. Repentance. What is the most dangerous thing in God's church that happens? What do you think? Is it changes? Is it transition? Is it, new? Is, it, is it having to evangelize the world? No, it's sin. Sin is the most dangerous thing in God's church. And yet, if sin is not repented of, the end of the road, what we just read, is death. So I want to help you with repentance. Because we're talking about not even giving in right now. But yet we do. So when we do, we've got to talk about repentance. I want to help you. Repentance is not an effort. It's a decision. Okay? It's not an effort. See, your human effort cannot save you. Repentance is, an effort, is not an effort. It's a decision that's followed by the appropriate deeds for that decision. And if the deeds aren't there, the decision wasn't made. If it's an effort in us, then it is reliance on the flesh. And yet God grants you spirit to be able to decide and strength to follow through. Remember, you make you sin. Second, the kill shot. Go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. 
See, after Satan tempts you and gets you weakened and breaks you down, he comes in for the kill shot. Job 1, verse 6. This is your proof that there's demons in this room right now. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. Check this out. Satan also came with them. How about that? There's all the angels, and then there's Satan. You don't see God freak out. He's not scared of Satan. See, he's the one that's got all the power. That's why you got to go to him. It says Satan was, came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? This is the funniest thing ever, the answer Satan gives. It's just like a person not doing well spiritually, this super vague answer. <laughs> Satan answered the Lord, well, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Okay, great. So you told me nothing. <laughs> That's what he does, though. When he tempts you, he gets you to be vague, yes. not specific. Yes. Yes. See, people sleep with somebody and they go, okay, what's going on? Oh, a little bit of impurity. Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. You had a fight with your wife? Oh, I just told her she got to stop doing that. Right. Really? So we're here talking because you said stop doing that? Right. <laughs> like, we get so vague when Satan is in there, you know? Because it's his spirit that's leading the thing. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? We got to just stop right there. Whoa. Wait a minute. So God offers us up? Wow. I mean, seriously, he just like, Job, you're the sacrifice today. How about that? Wow. That's how we think of it, huh? Like, seriously, God goes, Job, like Satan, most powerful being beside me on the planet. Have you considered just terrorizing Job today? Like, wow. Like, really? You know what the answer is? Yes, really. So, let's see how this goes. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's why God offers you up, because that's how he views you. He's not, it's not a sacrifice. He's not offering you as a sacrifice for Satan to kill. He trusts that Jesus really is your Lord, and you're really going to do what's right. So he has no fear. Now, if God did not view you as perfect already, he would not offer you up. But because the blood of Jesus covers you, you're perfect. So, hey, I've got no fear. He's fine. Satan has, has no chance with this one because he's perfect and hates evil. Come on, bro. Satan goes right to town tempting, though. Does Job fear for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him? Wait a minute. Where did a hedge come from? Father, let me not give in to temptation. That's where the hedge comes from. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? That'd be pretty cool. Does God have a hedge around everything you have? Or is it just getting picked at bit by bit? I bet if it's getting picked at bit by bit, you're not praying for the protection that you're afforded the ability to pray for. He says, you've blessed the work of his hands. So that his flocks and herds spread throughout the land. But stretch your hand and strike everything he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Wow. Now you know what Satan thinks of you. Now you know what God thinks of you. Perfect, awesome. You'll do fine with any temptation. Now you know what Satan thinks, what he's going for. Ah, you're, you stink. I just take your stuff and you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll just curse God. But what do you do when God strikes things you have, takes away things you have? See, many of us think that it was really what Job suffered. We're going to go to chapter 2 here, verse 1. We'll see the first of the attacks. Right after this, tempta right after this temptation came, God allowed Satan to strike all of the flocks and herds and just decimate them. Gone. That's like somebody steals your identity and all your money's just, you got nothing. Yet, we want to think it's because of all these things 
that Job had to suffer of why he gave into temptation. I put before you it's not. Let's find out. Chapter 2, verse 1. On another day, see, after all the flocks and herds were gone, on another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered, well, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. He's always got the same answer. <laughs> Things have changed, but not his answer. Wow. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shun evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incite me against him to ruin him without reason. I mean, there's God defending you. Like, wow. You know, every time you have a victory and you do not give in, God's like, see, I told you. Integrity. Awesome. That's my kid. Then here goes Job. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. He is in your hands, but you got to spare his life. Oh, thanks, God. (laughs) Wow, really? And God goes, yeah, really. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself as he sat among the ashes. You think you had a bad day this week. I don't know. I just haven't heard of anybody with a broken piece of pottery like scratching themselves Because of what Satan's doing to them. So he goes on here. Wow. Time for the wife to be the right hand and support her husband. (laughs) His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Wow. Time to give in, right? Time to give in, right? He replied, and if Job's a righteous man, we want to, like, read it like it's yelling. And yet there's no exclamation point. Wow. wow what a husband. <laughs> You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. Wow. Unimaginable devastation of finances and of physical health. And yet Job did not sin in what he said. Like, whoa. Like, okay. Like, I can just keep from punching somebody, but controlling everything I say under that? Like, wow. Wow. Like, whoo, Job's the man. Then if we find in chapter 3, Job starts to break down a little bit. I'll let you read it. But Job cursed the day of his birth, the Bible says. Ever had a day like that? I I don't know. I've been an angry man in my life at different times. I've cursed the day of other people's birth. I've just never cursed the day of mine. I don't know. Like, wow. Wow. So Job is cursing the day of his own birth in chapter 3. And then comes the kill shot, chapter 4. I'm going to let you read that too. If I give you everything, you won't go make it your convictions, you know. We have plenty of time to read it, but I'm going to let you read it. Satan is flat out to take you out. Make no mistake about it. He is going for the first death and the second death. He's not just going for killing you physically. He's going for the whole shebang. He wants you with him for eternity. And so chapter 4 is where the kill shot comes. Chapter 4 is when his friends start getting in there. So Job is scraping himself with pottery, still maintaining it with his wife, keeping his household under right there. But then the friends come, and they're like, dude, you're in sin. 
He's like, no, I'm not. Like, yeah, dude, you're in sin. Look at you. You're doing this. You're doing. Then all the friends with the stupid comments come in. These guys just like going after him, not even knowing what they're talking about. I mean, these were some pretty stout dudes. They were awesome guys. But they were not right about what sin he was in. You ever been there? You ever had one of the brothers and sisters just go after you? And they're so far off base, but there's still something wrong with you, but they're off base. That's, I put before you that you could suffer like physical pain. You can have all your money decimated. You can have your car taken away. But once your friends start going after you, man, it's all over with. That's when you give in to the temptation because you're now focused on man. You ever been there? Ooh. I remember about a year ago. <laughs> there it comes. About a year ago, we got here from D.C. And, you know, we, we've, God has just blessed us in so many ways. Great friends, great training, awesome ministries that we've been able to lead. I mean, we've gotten into some tough situations and then just seeing God just do miracles before our eyes. It's phenomenal stuff. And, you know, we had our old movement, and we were part of that, and that was great. I'm what, I'm what, they, what we call a remnant guy, okay? So I was part of the old fellowship, and, uh, you know, we thought we were going to win the world in our day, and the world was going to be evangelized. Some of you thought Jesus was just going to come right after that, and we were just done. So, and then it didn't happen. And, uh, and all the fellowship broke apart, and people started pointing at each other and blaming each other and shifting, jockeying for position and being about power and who's in charge, who's going to make final decisions. And it just got messy. Right, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. And then we started this movement in 2006. And I remember Tim from Canada and uh, me in Portland, and Tim had his website that he's fighting back with everybody about what's right and whatnot. And... Um, and even some of the guys that were coming after me, Tim started going after them online. He's like, tow, tow, tow. I was like yeah, who's this Tim guy from Canada, man? I like this guy. It's awesome. And yet, at the beginning of our movement, there's just such sweet fellowship that we've developed. There's a unity like there was never there before. There's true family for the first time. That's why God had to destroy it, because there wasn't the family that was needed. We will not win the world if we're not family. Yeah. And so I got used to that sweet fellowship. And, you know, it's funny. You, your skin can, you can be, like, really tough. Like, I took a stand against 5,000 people. It was, like, no problem. And then, you know, you, you don't get attacked for a while, and your, thin, your skin just gets a little thinner and a little thinner, a little thinner. That was Satan, you know, wearing me down. And, uh, and then I got here, and, you know, Tracy and I, we've had some great times in the ministry, but we've also had some very tough times. And many of our tough times came because of our own life and our own decisions and our own marriage and different things. So we got here. We knew we had some marriage things to, to work on and whatnot. Um, but then our closest friends were like, no, your marriage is super bad. What? what are you talking about? And he started focusing. What are you talking about? Instead of what's God talking about? You know? Then all of a sudden, I'm here with an attitude tempted and giving in and we had a lot of sit downs you know Tim's just like bro you're just getting it from the Lord dude the Lord's just spanking you a little bit just take it and move on what's you know no I'm not moving on I'm gonna hit back that's the stupidest thing you could ever do it's the stupidest thing ever when God is disciplining you even see what God will allow is he'll allow your friends to see there's something wrong like deeply wrong and then let them be just slightly off about it so you don't want to listen to them. So they're 90% right and 10% wrong, and all you go is, get that 10% right or we're not talking. <laughs> and there I sat, dinner after dinner, talk after talk. That's where I sat. You know, we want to think that we're tough guys, right? Guys, let me talk to you for a second, guys, right? You want to think you're a tough guy, right? Yeah. You're not tough. No. Stand before Satan, you are not tough. No. I was like, dude, you beat me a little bit. I'm going to beat you back. I'm going to break your arm. I learned some things as a minister. So that Bible's a weapon. So back off. Like, seriously, that's how sinful I was getting. It was sick. It was disgusting. 
God could do nothing with that. All that could happen with that is Satan have a field day on me, which he did. I'm so grateful for Tim and Leanne and Michael and Sharon. These are the ones that pulled us out of this. And, you know, Kip helped out quite a bit as well. But, you know, we get tempted to put out the Spirit's fire with our own anger. Because where was God in anything I said or thought? Nowhere. God is tempting me with you. That's where I was at. Make sure, make, make no mistake. Satan is out to get you. And it's when you get to that place that he will send his kill shot, which is your closest friends, just trying to help you out. Thirdly, the lie of all lies. The lie of all lies. See, when Satan comes in for the kill shot, then he starts really picking you apart with lies. Wow. There's no one that's worthy to be at this pulpit preaching Jesus' prayer. Only Jesus himself is worthy of that. Amen. And yet I'm still called by God to lay out why this prayer is so important in the scriptures. Because it is the key to you holding on to every conviction that you learned in the first principle studies about how to follow Jesus. One by one, he steals those convictions as he tempts you and you give in. Yeah. Yeah. The first thing he goes for, and I really want to influence you to, maybe I can change your mind here today about what your biggest sin is. See, you're supposed to get in this Bible and dig and study. Right. I mean, break it apart, study it, dig into it, read it, know it, memorize it, listen to it. Get out all the music and put on some scriptures or something. Even most, even most of the gospel stuff that's out there is sung by immoral people who claim Jesus and don't live that way. That's, I, the music is good, but that's why I don't like most gospel music. Because I know the lives of many who sing it. They even flaunt those bad lives and then sing about Jesus. I just can't listen to that. And yet... I think our biggest sins is not having just flat, blowing it out, awesome, quiet times every day. Really. It's the key to everything. You can't do anything without that. What, what excuse can you go up to God and say, this is why I didn't have a great quiet time. I did not have enough time, God, to get with you the top priority in my life. How's that going to work out? The only reason we don't do it is because we became king again. We said, Jesus, you're king, you're Lord, except I don't have time for a good quiet time. And I think that's our biggest sin, really, is not staying connected with God like that. It leads to all others. See, Jesus, we said Jesus is Lord. He's my Savior. Everybody wants a Savior. Save me, save me, save me from all these things that are happening because I'm not obeying you. Yet, yeah, he's Lord of our schedule. He's Lord of our time. He's Lord of our decisions. He's Lord of our family, our money, our spouse, our kids, everything. And yet Satan steals the conviction to really let Jesus be Lord of our life. He's Lord of our tithe, what we give each week. You know, after, after we do this, uh, Michael and Sharon are going to get up and they're going to lead our thoughts in communion, uh, which is going to be incredible. And then we're going to give our contribution. And yet, if you don't give, you're not worshiping Jesus, and he's not Lord of your life. And you've given in to temptation. Um, the giving thing is interesting. I don't want your money. It's funny, like the last week, like five people have tried to give me money to turn like, Don't give the minister money. Ministers don't touch money. I don't want your money. I don't need your money. God doesn't need your money. But he tells you to give a certain amount. Here's the thing, like, here's how Satan steals your money. With Job, he just struck the flocks, right? How Satan does it with us is he gets you to come in and rob God of what you're supposed to give him, and then God puts you under curse and decimates it all. That's how he steals it from you. Tempts you to not give what you're supposed to give. And so today, worship. Give to the Lord what you know the Bible calls you to give. Amen? He gets us to lack in our commitment. Things like Bible talk. Like he tempts us to come into Bible talk and make up for our lack of quiet time. Go, that wasn't a very good lesson. But that wasn't what it was for, though. It was so that people will come to church with us and learn that they too can read the Bible and understand it. 
It's for other people to learn that they can have a good quiet time. They can read and they don't have to be scared of what the Bible says. And then be enticed like, this is pretty cool. I think I want to come check this out. He tempts us to not get together for discipling times. And, and, and you know, we all know we're supposed to. Anybody not know we're supposed to have a discipling time? We're, we all know it, right? We're to teach each other to obey everything Jesus commanded. And yet, did you do it this week? That's the real question. Because it, we've been talking about it. The Bible talks about it all over the place. But are you doing it? Because that's what takes care of your soul, being taught to obey Jesus. You have your quiet time, then you got the cherry on top, your brother or sister even helping you beyond your quiet time to learn to be more obedient. And so Satan steals that from us. Oh, I double booked. Oh, I just, we, we, I just forgot. Well, we, we remember the things that are important to us. That's the reality is we remember what's important to us. So if you forgot, you got to you got to pick one or the other. It's not just I forgot. It's also got to be I forgot because it wasn't that important. I had other things that were more important that took my time. We're supposed to have daily contact. Encourage one another daily. And we go, well, nobody called me. But the Bible says for you to call. (laughs) Give encouragement every single day to somebody. You know, I I feel good enough about my discipling relationship with Tim to put it out. I mean, Tim and I, we communicate every day. I mean, Tim's probably, bro, it's enough. I mean, four, five, six times a day. Hey, bro, what about this? What about that? And he, hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. We, we just, we're working together in our life as partners together. And, and I want to know how Tim does things. See, here's the thing. Here's the reality. For L.A., right, we know that those who teach are judged, what, more strictly. So in L.A., which, which man is going to get the most strict judgment about what happens in L.A.? Congratulations, Tim. Turn in. Yes. So wouldn't I want the way that, wouldn't I want him to know what he's going to be judged by? So that means I got to learn the way he does things so I can do them the way he does them. I've been around 23 years, but if I do something a different way than him, then he doesn't know what I'm doing, but he's still got to answer to God for it. And so I want to learn how he does things, learn to be like him in the ways that, he, that God chose him for and run the ministry like he runs the ministry Amen. so that he can answer to God properly and know what he's answering for. Amen. But that's just the way I conduct myself in my discipling relationship with Tim. I think if you read your Bible, you'll come to find that's what God calls us to. Amen. And then when I've shown faithful and trustworthy, then he'll go, you decide, which he does all the time already anyway. But, yeah. but, but see, we're supposed to have a great discipling relationship on, with who discipled me. And I, and I want to just help us with one temptation Satan gives us like who's discipling us so I've kind of heard different rumblings of people that you know are married and the the people discipling them haven't been married as long the thought like in the comments like they can't help me Um, or you know that that brother doesn't have a kid can't help me with my child well you know it's this funny thing there's this thing called the bible And no matter who's discipling you, it doesn't change. And all the answers are still right here, not in that person. The answers do not reside in the heart of the person who's discipling you. They reside in the scriptures that that person's going to show you. You consider Timothy, who is never married, led a whole church. Can you imagine if you said to Timothy, dude, you can't help me? I know you're called by God and the church leader and like, Paul's favorite guy and all that, but you can't help me because you don't have a kid. How are you going to help me in my marriage, Timothy? And you know, Timothy would have said, well, you know, right here in Ephesians 5, it says husbands, that's what he would have done. And that's what helps us. See, God gave you that person because there's something from that person that he wants you to learn. Something in their character, something in the way they think, something in the way they do. But they don't have all the answers for you. The Bible does. Just pray that they show you the scriptures and learn what Jesus wants you to learn. And then he'll bring you on to somebody else that has something different to learn. Amen? Amen. Remember, Satan is out to get you. He wants to put your focus on man. Pray for the protection so that you will succeed. Lastly, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Lastly, I want to give you the confidence that you always have a way out of your temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I can't tell you how many times I get with people. I can't tell you how many times people have gotten with me. And the answer to why did you do that is I just didn't have another choice. Like, we really believe like we get cornered and we only have like one option. You know, you tell that to like a professional football head coach. There's only one thing that you could do here. He's like, dude, I got a full playbook full of plays. I got every option under heaven. I don't care what they do. I've got an answer for it. That's how we need to think as disciples. You are afforded every scripture in 66 books of the Bible. I mean, just, you got every scripture in there. That is an opportunity for a way out of a temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Again, he talks about what the people who are drifting. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink, for they all drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Wow. Jesus was not the only one sacrificed for you and me. We come to find that right here in verse 6. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. What's that? Party. So the people, they didn't stay up and party, the Bible says. They sat down and they ate and drank and got up. They were up early in the morning partying in idolatry. It says, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did. And so we're killed by snakes. These guys were so stupid that they're like, I'm going to let this snake bite me because I'm one of God's kids. It's not going to do anything. What? (laughs) And they go... What I equate that to is something I see a lot nowadays. Now, you're free to live your life, make your choices. I cannot force any of you to do anything. God forbid anyone should say that anyone is controlled. If we could control that nobody would commit sexual sin. If I control you, that just wouldn't happen. But I can't even control me many times. How am I going to control you? And yet... There's, some, there's this phenomena of things that happen in our new movement that I just don't understand. It's single men and single women riding alone in a car together. It's the darndest thing. You know, there's a truth about the way God made us. The longer you spend with one person of the opposite sex, the more attracted to them you become. Hmm. And the closer the proximity in which you are together... And the closer you are, coupled with how much time, the quicker you get attracted. It has nothing to do with looks. It has nothing to do with body shape. None of that. You will become attracted the more you spend time. And it's the darnest thing that so many of you just ride alone all over the place. Now, you're free to do that. I can't say you're in sin because you do it. But I am free, too. So I can say it's really stupid to do that. Please don't tempt yourself like that. Don't test the Lord and get bit by that snake. Yes. Yes. And then verse 10, and then the Bible says, and this happens in times of transition. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. 
So this one's really simple, right? This one's really easy. So this is how it works. You grumble, destroying angel. Stop grumbling, destroying angel goes away. <laughs> Keep grumbling, destroying angel stays right there until you're what? Destroyed, because it's the destroying angel. So I just want to help us out. You may think you have an awesome reason to complain. I know every time I do it, I think it's an awesome reason. <laughs> this is why I'm grumbling. You know, Tim called me. Oh, I called Tim, actually, on, uh, I think it was Wednesday we had to talk, right? Somewhere like Wednesday. And, and I'm talking to Tim, and, you know, it does hit me. It hits my heart when people leave right. and walk away. Yeah. And I was feeling discouraged, and Tim was like, bro, because he understands this concept of destroying angel coming, right? So he's like, bro, you know, the last three times I talked to you, you've been pretty discouraged. Like, how long are you going to keep that up? How long do you think that can go well for you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Not, you know, it can't go. Why are you doing it? Because I'm being stupid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's, just, let's just cut that out right there. Yeah. And you know, repentance is not an effort. It's a decision. Yeah. And literally from that point forward, the rest of the week, I've been fine. Awesome. And destroying angel just flew away. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> It's an amazing thing. It's right there, and you just, ah, 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 ah. I not complain. It's just, that hurt. Oh, my gosh. Why is that happening? Yeah. We just, like, we got to stop grumbling so that the angel will go away. Yeah. That's the angel. That's not even yeah. a demon. Wow. Bible says in verse 11 here, these things happen to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages come. So if you think you're standing firm, that's probably the older Christian that's been a leader and not as committed as before. That's, that's probably that Christian more. I think you're standing firm. Be careful that you don't fall. Check this out. Now, we misunderstand verse 13 because we don't know verse 14. No temptation has seized you. Uh, first, I mean, second half of verse, verse 13 is what we don't understand. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. We really like that. Don't you like that? Yes. Yet we don't understand that part. Because what we read into it in our society, because we're so entitled, is God's not ever going to give me anything I don't like. So my expectation is you're just not, you're not going to do anything that I, don't really, I really don't like. And then when something happens that we really don't like, we go, God! Or whoever it came through, Jermaine! We get all mad. Because we don't understand this part. But when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so you can stand on up under it. Amen? Is that encouraging? But, and yet, and yet, why would you have to stand up? Why would you have to stand up? I mean, what are you doing when you have to stand up? Because you're where? Down. Because you got knocked down. See, God will let you be tempted to a degree that you're knocked down. And then he gives you a way back to stand on up. See, we think we're not going to get knocked down. That's where we get off track. That's when we start giving in to the temptations. And so today, I, I want to help you understand, you always have a way out. The temptations and the trials are there to strengthen you because God has phenomenal plans for you. Amen. He will absolutely give you more than you can stand in the moment so that you will fall, rely on him, and then get back up. Amen? Stronger than you ever were before. Amen. And you've just got to believe that in every situation, when it just looks like this is my only, anytime you get, this is the only thing I can do right now. Stop and get in your Bible. Because there are a million other answers of how you can get out of this situation. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. We'll close with this passage. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. This is all 
the last part of the prayer. Since then, children have flesh and blood. He too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. That would be you. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonements for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered what, when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. If Jesus himself had to be tempted with everything that we were tempted with, if he had to be tempted to the degree of great suffering, how much must we be tempted to be in a place where we can help save this lost world? This morning, let us believe in the power of the Lord's Prayer. Let us believe that God can and will save you from every temptation you have. And as we pray that prayer, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Let us not forget to finish that prayer and lead us not into temptation. Have mercy and give me the strength. He will give it to you today. I love you all very much. Have an awesome